Here we're gonna give several examples that the limit of a sequence has a certain value using the standard epsilon n definition for a limit. So I wanna go ahead and recall that definition real quick, then I will recall an outline for like a standard proof, and then we'll look at a bunch of examples. So given a sequence a sub n, n goes from one to infinity, so we've got this infinite list of numbers, a1, a2, a3, a4, and so on and so forth. Those are all real numbers. We say that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals l if for every epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a capital N in the natural numbers, such that for all little n bigger than or equal to that capital N, we have the absolute value of a sub n minus L is less than epsilon. In other words, any challenge that you give me of an epsilon, which is super small, I can find an N such that if we are further than that point in the sequence, then our sequence is within epsilon of that limit. So here's an outline for a proof that proves the claim, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals L. So I wanna point out a couple of things first. First of all, generally you guess what the limit should be using some standard methods from calculus one or two. So you should have a good feel for what the limit is before you launch into the proof. Next, before you even start the proof, you want to do some scratch work. And that scratch work involves really calculating your capital N value. That means you're going to start with your goal inequality, which is the absolute value of a sub n minus l is less than epsilon. Then you're going to reduce that using known inequalities like the triangle inequality if necessary and other like standard arithmetic techniques until you get down to this point right here where n is bigger than or equal to bunch of stuff. So you want to reduce this inequality down until like little n is totally by itself. And all of that stuff that you'll have on the right hand side, that will become your capital N. And it is generally going to depend on epsilon. It will in fact always depend on epsilon unless the sequence is kind of boring in the first place. Now that you've done that scratch calculation, you can launch into the proof. And generally, you can use the same structure for any of these. You just have to fill in the gaps. So given epsilon bigger than zero, take n to be equal to, well, it's that stuff that you calculated over there. And this should kind of seem like it comes from nowhere when you're reading the proof for the first time. Next, you want to use some sort of words to transition into the calculation that you'll do. So I like to say observe that or notice that or something like that. So we're gonna say observe that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, recalling that the capital N is this thing way up here with all of these epsilons, then, and now you reverse the calculations that you did over there to end at the goal, which is absolute value of a sub n minus L is less than epsilon. And so notice, given some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero, you have found a capital N such that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, the sequence is with an epsilon of L. But that is exactly what you need to show that everything having to do with this definition is satisfied so you can say that this limit is L as needed. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up and then we're gonna launch into some examples. So we'll start by showing that the limit as n goes to infinity of one over the square root of n is equal to zero. So this is kind of an obvious value for the limit as n gets larger and larger and larger. You have larger number in the denominator, which is gonna make the whole thing become smaller and smaller and smaller until it tends towards zero. So let's go ahead and look at our scratch work. So L is being played by zero and the role of a sub n is being played by one over the square root of n. So that means our scratch work is going to start with 1 over the square root of n minus 0 is less than epsilon. And that's in absolute values. But really the 0 is not doing anything and in fact the absolute value is not doing anything here either because root n is always positive so that's the same thing as 1 over root n is going to be less than epsilon. Now we can go ahead and square both sides. That's going to give us 1 over n is less than epsilon squared, which is the same thing as n is bigger than 1 over epsilon squared. So notice we take the reciprocal and it changes the order of the um, inequality. And now this guy right here will in fact be our capital N. So now we can launch into the proof. 
So let's say we are given some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. Let's go ahead and take capital N. And I want to point out that sometimes authors put a capital N sub epsilon here really to drive home the idea that this N depends on epsilon. Now let's go ahead and take this to be one over epsilon squared like we calculated over there. But one over epsilon squared is probably not a natural number. So what we will do is take the ceiling of this. And then next, because we have a greater than or equal to here, we probably want to add one to it just to be sure that we're big enough. OK, great. And now what we want to do is notice that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, well, that means that little n is strictly bigger than the ceiling of 1 over epsilon squared. So notice because it's bigger than or equal to the ceiling of 1 over epsilon squared plus 1, which means it is strictly bigger than the ceiling of 1 over epsilon squared. But notice if it's bigger than the ceiling of 1 over epsilon squared, then it is going to be bigger than just 1 over epsilon squared. And I guess we could just continue this on here because the ceiling is always bigger than or equal to the thing that's inside. Okay, good. But now we can just work those steps in reverse. So this means that 1 over n is less than epsilon squared, which tells us that 1 over root n is less than epsilon, which is the same thing as saying the absolute value of 1 over root n minus 0 is less than epsilon, which is what we needed to end at to finish off our proof. So let's see, given epsilon bigger than 0, we have found our n. And if n is bigger than or equal to this capital N, then we have the right inequality involving epsilon at the bottom. So we have proven this limit. OK, I'll clean this up and we'll do another. So for our next example, we're going to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n over 2n plus 5. And we know from calculus that that should be 3 halves. And that's because we have a linear term in the numerator and in the denominator. The coefficient of n in the numerator is 3, and the coefficient of n in the denominator is 2. OK, so we're going to go over here and start with our scratch work. So we want to look at 3n over 2n plus 5 minus 3 over 2. So notice that is a sub n minus l. Now we want to go ahead and reduce that. So that means we need to give this a common denominator. So we are give this a common denominator of 2n plus 5 2n plus 5, which means we need to multiply this by 2 over 2. That gives everything a common denominator. So let's see what that uh, sets us up with. So we're going to have 6n over 2 times 2n plus 5 minus, so that's going to be 6n plus 15 over 2 times 2n plus 5. And that is all still in absolute values. But now we have like uh, similar denominators or equal denominators, I should say here, so we can simplify some things. So I'll do this kind of all at once. Notice we've got 6n minus 6n. Those are going to cancel. Then we have minus 15 in the numerator. But since we're taking absolute values, the minus sign will go away. And then after that, everything else is positive. So we can just take the absolute value away. And we get that this thing is equal to 15 over 2 times 2n plus 5. And our goal is for that to be less than epsilon. OK, great. But notice that's the same thing as saying 1 over 2n plus 5 is less than 2 epsilon over 15, just by kind of moving things around. And then similarly, we can take a reciprocal. So that gives us 2n plus 5 is bigger than 15 over 2 epsilon. Then finally, we can subtract 5 from both sides and then divide by 2. So doing that gives us n is bigger than uh, 15 over 4 epsilon and then minus 5 over 2. So we get something like that. So now we can launch into our proof, which will be pretty similar to what we did before. So let's say we are given epsilon bigger than 0. Let's go ahead and take capital N to be, well, now it's going to be essentially that thing over there. We have to tweak it a little bit so that it works with our non-strict inequality over here and so that we know that we have a natural number. I want to point out that some authors will have a strict inequality right here, but it's, a, it's an equivalent definition.
Notice we could have n bigger than or equal to capital N is the same thing as n strictly bigger than capital N minus one. It's just like renaming that capital N a little bit. All right, great. So let's go ahead and do this. So this is gonna be 15 over four epsilon minus five halves. If you're psyched, you could combine that together, but it doesn't really matter. Again, we don't know that that's a natural number, so we'll take the ceiling of that because we want you know, to err on the side of caution and push that higher. And then again, we'll add one, just like we did before. Okay, so I wanna maybe point out here, and this was the same in the last case. Generally, we're thinking about epsilon as a very, very small number because we want to have A sub N and L very, very close together. But if epsilon is a very, very small number, putting in the denominator makes this capital N a very, very large number, which makes sense because in order to get the value of the sequence super duper close to the limit, you should have to go pretty far into the sequence. Well, that kind of depends on the, speeds of, the speed of convergence, but yeah, you should ha be, have to go further to get closer. All right, good. Now we can go ahead and finish it off. So now let's say observe that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, then little n is strictly bigger than 15 over four epsilon minus five halves. So I kind of skipped a little step here, but that follows immediately because we know that n is gonna be bigger than or equal to this, but that means it's strictly bigger than this without the plus one, but that means it's strictly bigger than that without the ceiling as well, because we're just driving it smaller by taking the plus one off and the ceiling off. Okay, good. But now we can just reverse the calculation that we did over there. Notice that that gives us immediately 2n plus 5 is bigger than 15 over 2 epsilon, just by moving it around. But then also that gives us 1 over 2n plus 5 maybe uh, is less than 2 epsilon over 15. Good but then that immediately gives us 15 over two times two n plus five is less than epsilon, great. But then, let's see, that is the same thing as exactly what we started with over there. So I'll just write that as my very last step. This is the same as the absolute value of three n over two n plus five minus three halves is less than epsilon which is exactly where we needed to finish. And in my mind, this step from here to here is not too big of a jump, but obviously it's gonna kinda depend on who's teaching your course. Um, so, you know, make sure to be careful about that. Okay, I'll go ahead and clean this up and we're gonna do one more. For our last example, we're gonna show that the limit as n goes to infinity of n squared plus two over n squared plus n is equal to one. So again, we should kinda of know that this is the limit from calculus one or calculus two. Notice we've got quadratics in the numerator and the denominator and they have the same coefficient in the highest order term, the squared term in this case. So that tells you that we should have one as the limit. But we're gonna prove this carefully using the definition just like we did for the other two. So let's go ahead and work out our scratch work here. So we want this a sub n term, which in this case is n squared plus two over n squared plus n minus the limit to be less than epsilon. That's an absolute values. So let's go ahead and do the same thing that we did before, give that a common denominator. Common denominator here will be n squared plus n. So that means I'm gonna replace this one with n squared plus n over n squared plus n. So let's see what that gives us. So that is going to give us n squared plus two over n squared plus n minus n squared plus n over n squared plus n. And again, our goal is for that to be less than epsilon. I wanna point out here that we're subtracting that whole thing, so we're gonna to have to distribute that minus sign. So we'll have to be careful about that. Okay, good. Now, let's go ahead and do that uh, arithmetic there. So make that subtraction. So notice that is going to leave us with two minus n over n squared plus n, and that needs to be less than epsilon. Okay, great. But now we have to play some games. It's not as straightforward as it was before. We have to maybe 
change this thing a little bit in order to make the inequality work nicely. So this shouldn't be too bad, but let's see what we can do. We've got n squared plus n in the denominator. So notice if I take away the n in the denominator, I have made the denominator smaller, which makes the entire thing larger. So this inequality will follow from the inequality 2 minus n over n squared is less than epsilon. Good. And then furthermore, I can go ahead and replace this 2 minus n in the numerator. Maybe we'll replace that with n minus 2 over n squared is less than epsilon. So I'd rather have the minus on the 2 than on the n. Okay. So the next thing that I can do is notice that that numerator can be made smaller if I add 2 to it. So in other words, this inequality will hold if the inequality n over n squared is less than epsilon holds. And that's because this inequality n minus n squared will fit in between the epsilon and our goal. And I might as well point out that this inequality right here will fit in between the epsilon and our goal as well. So it may seem like we're doing a cheat because we're moving the inequalities in the wrong direction, but you have to recall that we're kind of working in reverse here. Okay, now finally I want to point out that this n over n squared is the same thing as 1 over n um, being less than epsilon. But now notice that that inequality is equivalent to the one where we say n is bigger than 1 over epsilon. And so that sets up our good choice for our capital N just like it did in the previous examples. All right, good. So now let's go ahead and launch into the proof. So let's say we are given some epsilon bigger than 0. Let's take capital N. Maybe I'll put the capital N here to be equal to, well, let's just start off by writing one over epsilon, but that's probably not gonna work because that's not a natural number. So we'll take the ceiling, so that turns it into a natural number, and then we'll add one because we have this non-strict inequality over here. Now, the next thing that I wanna do is observe that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, so we know that little n is going to be strictly bigger than 1 over epsilon. So that follows from how we defined the capital N. And we have this following kind of nice sequence of inequalities. So we'll start way over here with our epsilon. And notice that we have 1 over n is less, less than epsilon because n is bigger than 1 over epsilon. But now 1 over n is going to be equal to the absolute value of n over n squared, which is going to be less than the absolute value of n minus 2 over n squared. And I guess you could say, well, n has to be large enough here. Make sure that n is bigger than or equal to 2. So you could, in fact, take capital N to be the maximum of that and 2, for instance. But, you know, I'll let you guys write that down a little bit more carefully if you need to. Good. But then from here, we can jump to this guy is going to be bigger than n minus 2 over n squared plus n. Again, we know that because this, we're making the denominator larger, which makes the whole thing smaller. But then this thing is exactly equal to absolute value of n squared plus 2 over n squared plus n minus 1. So we have this entire string of inequalities that starts with our goal and works through all of those steps over there to end with our epsilon. But maybe reading the extreme left and right-hand side of this inequality, we see that that's exactly what we need to finish off this definition um, of the limiting value. And that's a good place to stop this proof and a good place to stop the video.